This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with sculptor Frances Bagley about her long career as a key figure in the Dallas arts community. Frances is in the collection of the Dallas Museum of Art, in the National Museum of Women in Washington, D.C., amongst others but is probably best known for contributions to corporate collections and public art commissions nationwide. At the end of the episode, I'll be taking a look at some of the week's top art headlines. But first up, The Pursuit of 3D Form with Francis Bagley. Francis, I really appreciate you being willing to sit down on a Saturday morning in talk about your your life's work and so uh you're not originally from texas no i'm not originally from texas as a matter of fact i uh, grew up in tennessee mm-hmm. but between tennessee and texas i lived a lot of places okay. including england and arizona and san francisco and georgia a uh, brief time in illinois so i actually um you know have had uh an experience in uh, in a broad section of uh, places to live, but um, I've stayed in Texas by far the longest, and um, it's one of those uh, decisions that I didn't think I was making, but I realized I had, <laughs> because when I first came to Texas, I thought, well, this is going to be a couple of years, and you know, now it's probably been over thirty, easy. Right. And, but I will say, I think actually Dallas has served me well, and mm-hmm. I feel a real strong commitment to this art community and have worked for the community, especially in years past. I um, ran the Dallas Area Rapid Transit Public Art Program oh, wow. early on, I was mm-hmm. the developer of it. And then uh, I taught in several of the universities here and um, have really put roots down. I feel like there's something about the Dallas and the Texas, but Dallas specifically, art community that is, is, um, I don't know if nurturing is the right word, but it feeds you. Mm -hmm. And many people who lived here and moved away say that's what they miss the most is the support from the other artists right there's not a real strong sense of competition amongst artists in dallas it's much more about pat you on the back and what can we do to help sure which has been something that i've um, fed off of and contributed to through my career so tom and i are kind of like safeway Way or was some anchor tenant <laughs> who's been in this town a long time and right. have uh, been involved in very pivotal, pivotal moments in the development of the community. You know, you talk about the DART public art program. We look back, say, 40 years ago, what uh, the state of public arts would have looked like in Dallas in terms of just driving mm-hmm. around and seeing mm-hmm. public art. It was zero, right. except for some of the donations that the city had accepted. So uh, <clears throat> when public art began to be uh, an, an item, an issue in our country, I'm trying to see if I can conjure up the, the dates. Um, probably late 80s. Um, Dallas embraced it. And they brought in people from uh, Seattle, where and Seattle was the premier uh, example of public the development of public art earlier on, and so uh, people were brought in from Seattle to give seminars to artists in Dallas to talk about how to think about trying public art. It was really valuable because. Uh, Jerry Allen was one of the main people, uh, and he gave us lectures on you have to respect yourself. You have to know that your time is 
worth money, right. and that it, it, and that's the way you you know one of the the foundations of approaching this sort of uh, endeavor. But then when Dallas did develop a percent for art program, I was mm -hmm. on the first committee with Nancy Nasher to develop that. Um, the way Dallas's ordinance for public art was written. So you, mm -hmm. I'm, I was totally on the ground floor of Dallas public art uh, development. And then when DART needed a public art um, program, mm -hmm. they chose me to develop it. And I did, uh, you know, all the uh, planning and developing of how it would be run and then actually ran it for five years while they d developed their starter line. Wow. So that was a great experience for me and I, I, I've often worn two hats because I also ran public art programs for, you know, or for projects for various other municipalities and, right. and uh, yet I really am the one that wants to be making the art, so I don't do that anymore. But um, it, it, I certainly know what you know both sides of that uh, process are, and uh, allows me to be, to be able to handle the bureaucracy a lot better than some artists can. So you you grew up in Tennessee. You you didn't go to college in Tennessee. You well, I did go to the University of Tennessee for a few years. Okay. Uh, and uh, then realized that I needed adventure because uh, I come from a, a very um, uh, rooted Tennessee family mm -hmm. that I wasn't getting away from in, at the University of Tennessee. Right. Uh, and I realized I wanted to be on my own. And so um, <clears throat> one summer uh, when I came home from college, I thought, how am I going to get out of here? And I found this ad for a ranch camp in Arizona that turned out to be a very illustrious place, right. but I wrote them a letter. And they uh, flew me to Atlanta to interview me, and I turns out I was the only person they had ever hired at that point who um, didn't have a connection, an inside connection. So the ranch camp is called Orm Ranch, and it still mm -hmm. exists, and it... it um, uh, had you know it, it's a school year round, but in the summer they bring in uh, you know kids of very very important wealthy people right. go there to have the ranch experience to learn horseback riding and arts and crafts and be on this forty acre operating cattle ranch and 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 actually you know have jobs collect eggs right. or groom the horses or or whatever so. Having grown up on a farm, it was perfect for me, and um, so I did that for uh, two years, I think, but I stayed in close contact with them longer, two summers, but all it took was that very first yeah. summer, and I was ready to move to Arizona. Sure. Because, so what, because, what do you think it was that, that made you that first person that wasn't part of the nepotism? Like, what, what set you apart? Was it growing up on a farm? Well, I, <laughs> this, is, this is a... I guess it maybe might illustrate it. Um, my mother was, as they called her, a Yankee. My Tennessee family was not, and um, you know, deep-rooted family. And as a matter of fact, when I first went to the University of Tennessee, my roommate's mother called my mother to introduce herself mm -hmm. and called back and said, oh my God, Francis's mother is a Yankee. So I was never, <laughs> I was always what they would call a half-breed in a way. You know, I had a lot of, um, and <clears throat> furthermore, uh, my mother and father both went to the University of Michigan. My father, although his family was deep-rooted, had, had lived all over as well because my grandfather was uh, in the military. So, uh, so the, any, my immediate family, was uh, always a bit rebellious and and uh, different than some of the rest of the family. So I had it, you know, I had an experience with that. We spent all our summers in my grandparents' summer home in Canada, so uh, or traveling around to get there. So I had had a lot of experiences outside of Tennessee, and I knew I wanted a broader life. Right. 
And so once you made it to Arizona, you figured out you wanted to stay there for a little bit. Well, I finished school there and got my first master's there. Uh, and because for me, the Arizona was like the moon. Right. I, you know, you, if you compare it to Tennessee with all the intimate foliage, these those vast uh, expanses of space uh, <clears throat> were very liberating and, and, and yet, you know, confusing. But that was what I was looking for. I was looking to really challenge myself, not only to new people, but new environment. After you got that first master's, uh, were you going straight into your, your personal art practice or were you thinking about teaching? I know you spent some time in England. Yes. How did you make that choice coming out of there? Well, it, <clears throat> in finishing school, uh, you know, I needed a job and um, my mother had, had been a teacher and my mother also actually has an art degree from the University of Michigan. So mm -hmm. I had that background as well. And uh, so I taught in an elementary school in Arizona as I was finishing my master's. I taught mm -hmm. art and actually to migrant children, which was really cool. Right. Uh, uh, so anyway, <clears throat> I had already had that teaching experience. And of course, the most obvious thing for people with a master's in, in art is to teach because that's a job that uh, you can do right. or that, 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 you know, is marketable. Um, so I was ready to do that, but um, I got married in Arizona to my first husband, and he was also an artist but a ceramicist. Okay. And at the time, I was taking ceramics, too. My degree is in painting and printmaking from, okay. from Arizona State. And... and um, Tempe, uh, but I got very, very involved in ceramics because it was three-dimensional. Sure. Um, and, and the reason I even mentioned three-dimensional is because at, as a painting student and, and having been a painter for a period of time, <laughs> I always realized, or I, I began to realize, that when I was painting, I was imagining what I was painting in real space. Sure. And that was kind of a clue that maybe I'm operating in a different space than the picture plane, mm -hmm. which is what I think people have to do if they're a painter. It's right. almost like you have to let yourself enter that world and it takes intense concentration. You're not in this physical world. I have a, I'm a very physically oriented person and mm -hmm. I understood that I wanted my body to relate to what I was making or mm -hmm. even other people's physical experience to relate to it. So little by little, I inched my way out of the 2, 2D plane and into the 3D plane. I had, had taken sculpture courses, but I was not at all interested in the macho way they were teaching sculpture at right. that time. We're talking the late 60s. Mm -hmm. So consequently, I mean, I had remarks made to me like, that's pretty good for a girl. Uh -huh. And um, I began to uh, realize that if you wanted to be successful in, those, in the art departments of universities at that point in time, you needed to, um, your work couldn't look like you were female. Right. It had to look like you were either male or neuter. So you were, you right. were always dodging. But, but that was right about the time Judy Chicago did the dinner party. So mm -hmm. that was also right about the time that the book, The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan uh, came out. Right. And it really, both those things and other things really hit me hard. I realized that I had not realized mm -hmm. how uh, suppressed, and not just in art, in all ways of life, th that I had been in all we women who are, you know, needing to be ourselves had been. Sure. And so I really embraced feminism at that point, and uh, it, it liberated me because when I could let my work show who I was, mm -hmm. then uh, it, it, it totally opened up all kinds of directions. You know. That transition from painting and printmaking to sculpture, did was it gradual? Did you find yourself starting to make reliefs mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. and then kind of 
figuring out. It was gradual, but not too gradual. It was. Uh, I had all my life made things. As a matter of fact, 